Okay. Good morning and welcome to Switch and Shift TV. This is Ted Coyne, your host, and I'm taking a break from writing my book, A World Gone Social. We're almost done. Maybe today we'll be finished. I, I'm not joking. I had to take a break in writing, though, for one reason only. One of my very favorite authors was available right now. So, Vineet Nayar is the author of Employees First, Customers Second. Yes, you heard that correctly. I didn't get it backwards. And he's also the former CEO, former vice chairman of HCLT, um, a very large enterprise in India, which well, actually globally, which he made from moderately successful into a breakout success. And now he runs the Sam Park Foundation, which I'm really eager to talk to him about. So we've got a lot to cover today, folks. I could introduce him for half an hour. That's how long this man's list of accomplishments are, but I'm not going to. The first thing I'm going to do instead is ask him about his name, Vineet. Vineet, what does your name mean, and why did you get it? Yeah, that's a very interesting story. So I used to be one of those very naughty kids. Uh, when I was three, I would stand on this uh, dining table in our house holding a glass, and my mother will come start running towards me, and I would count one, two, three, and then drop the glass, and the glass would break. So wow. I was one of, those, one of those naughty kids, which you definitely don't want in your house. <laughs> and one of my aunts said to my mother that the answer to this problem is change his name. And Vineet in Hindi means polite. So they came up with this new name called Vineet so that he will become polite and he will cool down. The reverse happened. So that's the reason when I'm in your show, be careful if you're talking to Vineet. Not the, <laughs> but the original one. <laughs> you still have the original Vineet. <laughs> I love it. I, I absolutely love it. So, you know, I wish that I had changed the names. You know, my wife and I had changed the names of our daughters to Meek and Quiet because <laughs> they are neither of those things. They are polite. But, um, yeah. oh, that is brilliant. Now, speaking of my daughters, they're a little bit older than in the picture behind me. When I was talking to my eldest daughter, she has been a passionate advocate for customer service her entire life. That's what happens when your daddy writes two books on the topic when you're a little kid. And so <laughs> when I told her the, subject, the, the title of your book and asked her why that might be a good title, she said, whoa, 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 that's crazy. Would you please, because uh, you know what? A lot of adults tell me that too. I tell them, okay, among my favorite books is this book you've got to read. And they say, that's, that's insane. Would you please explain your book to us? Yeah, so uh, first is, you know, daughters are very special in the world and say hi to your daughter. Uh, Good, I'll show her. Special. I mean, if ever I was to write, write this book, I would write that it's not the sons, but the daughters make fathers feel special, and my daughter does. Good man. And, uh, Good man. So the philosophy behind employee first, customer second was quite simple. Uh, we were on the crossroad uh, as a company uh, where we were losing mind share, market share, and talent share. Right. And uh, when in 2005 we had an opportunity of transforming the company, uh, we had two choices. Uh, choice one is to transform it on the board axis, uh, what Steve Jobs did in terms of produce awesome products. But there's an interesting axis which is called the how axis in terms of how you create the company, how you run the company. So the question we asked ourselves, can cultural transformation of a company, can culture be a competitive differentiator? Right. So it's not what you do, but how you do. And can how you do be a competitive differentiation right. which you bring to the market? Can that help you grow faster? The early success of that experiment we had seen with the Japanese, where you know their whole manufacturing techniques of so just-in-time Kaiser methodology and all that stuff. So I said, when I mean, the Japanese could reinvent how they produce the cars to beat the the world on on auto, automobiles, can we actually in the services economy? be the way on how we deliver services and create a competitive advantage. Then we asked ourselves four fundamental questions. Uh, the first was, what is the core business we are in? And the answer is to create 
services, differentiated experience services for our customers. Right. The second is, where does this differentiated unique experience get created? The answer is in the interface of our employees and our customers. Let's call that the value zone. Third question, who creates this differentiated value because of which you grow faster? The answer is our employees in that value zone create the experience so that we can grow faster. And hence, then the fourth most, fourth most important question, if your employees in that value zone create the differentiated experience for you to grow faster, what should the role of managers and the management be? The role of the managers and management has to be to enthuse, encourage, enable those employees in the value zone to create that unique experience for the customer so that you can grow faster. And hence, the role of managers and management has to be employees first, customer second. And that's how the concept was born. I, I love it. So anybody who has ever seen me interview a leader, has ever read a word I've said, knows that culture is everything for me. So my little model is 1% leadership creates 98% of importance within a company culture. And, and that leads to 1% um, customer service. It's almost a natural at that point. Now, um, that's enough about me. I don't, I, I don't care about me. You're more interesting. Please dive into the value zone because that is compelling, fascinating, and business leaders need to know about this. What does that mean in, in, uh, in your paradigm? So what, what really happens in life is that Arguments. I'm sorry. You're, I'm sorry. I want to interrupt you because you're breaking up, and I don't want to miss a word of what you said. Let's try again. So, yeah. So the point I was making was: Can you hear me clearly now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. The point I was making is that as you rise in the company, you move from the bottom to the top, and it's the it's a pyramid. Right. Now, in the pyramid, you assume that as you are going up, you are becoming more and more strategic. Uh, you're taking better quality decisions, and you're becoming more and more. But the point missed is that the customer interests with the company, not at the top of the pyramid, but at the bottom of the pyramid. Right. So what is, you are far away from the customer. And that is where the value is created. The value is created between your front-end employees and the customer front-end employees. So you should imagine two inverted pyramids facing each other with the bottom up, you know, on both bottoms. So that is the value zone. Now, the reason it is important to understand it is because any value decision which you take of the pyramid is relevant only if it is implemented experience at the bottom of the pyramid. And through that pyramid, it goes customer and customer experiences. Now, if you understand that you are the value creator at the top of the pyramid, but the value is really being created at the bottom of the pyramid, then you will do whatever it takes in the pyramid that the is focused at the bottom of the pyramid and through that to the, to the customer rather than focus at the top of the pyramid. And that is what I call inverting the organization structure so that it focuses on the value zone. Therefore, you are asking the employees not what did you do, but what can I do for you so that you can be more successful, so that the company can be more successful. And that is the cultural change which will take place. I absolutely love it. So, so to recap, the people who are actually interacting with the customers, regardless of your industry, those are the people that the customers think of as the company. And that is really going to determine, and this is why short-sighted management employs the cheapest labor. They're just stupid because often the cheapest labor is either the least educated or the least um, interested, the, the least, um, you know, enfranchised. So, so what you're saying is the people in the value zone the customer facing employees are the ones who are dealing with the customers so they are the rock stars of your company all yes, right it is it, it is true and you know to experience that very interestingly you just have to travel by a triple seven boeing triple seven 
and you try and travel by United Airlines or an American Airlines or a Singapore Airlines, and you exactly know what I'm talking about. Yeah. That the airline is the same, the seats are the same, the foods are the same, the wines are the same. However, why do you have a completely different experience in all the three airlines is predominantly because those employees are either enabled or disabled. Yeah. They are either motivated or demotivated. Uh -huh. They are either in the business of creating experience or they are in the business of delivering service. Right. So as a CEO, you are either in the business of improving the profits of your airline or you are in the business of making sure you do everything for that air hostess. For him or her to deliver a unique experience to the customer and you see that as your only role. And right. the resultant increase in revenue and profit will come because of what the air hostess or the check-in counter employee or engineer the aircraft does. Awesome, awesome. All right, so so you gave great examples. You gave two examples of companies that, in in my experience, give uh, hit or miss service, uh, United and American, and then you gave Singapore Airlines, which just blows away everybody in the field, the industry of flying. Um, it's the kind of thing where you don't want to get off the plane. So so that's it. That's an awesome, awesome comparison. Now, um, so what you're saying is. If employees are enabled, they will take care of the customers. If they're disabled, I love that. Like they're crippled in some way. That's so sad. And and uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is though, if you are leading a company, as you have, uh, are you focused on the profit or are you focused on making sure that people can do their best? And you s really, it's not an either or. It's a both, isn't it? If you're a wise leader, focusing on your people yeah. leads to more profit. Yeah, I, I think all your listeners should understand two things which are very important. Sure. Employee first, customer second is not a do good strategy, right? It's nothing to do with the fact that employees are, you know, you should be nice to the employees. Right. It is. I growth strategy. It is a strategy of creating a competitive advantage using motivated employees. Uh, by making the employees the key competitive differentiator, you actually can grow faster than any other strategy can deliver to you. The question I will ask all of you who are listening to this is as follows. How much time do you spend preparing for you to look good with your boss? Uh -huh. And how much time do you really spend preparing so that you can do good for your customer. I love it. So irrespective of what the tagline of your company is, if all that matters is the boss is asking the subordinate, okay, what did you do? And then the super boss is asking the boss, what did you do? So everybody is focused upwards. So when you are focused upwards, you can never walk straight. However, if the whole company is focused downwards, focus on the customers, you can walk straight, you can run, you can you do all that stuff. So the critical question in any organization is with the same set of resources, you can run twice as fast as you are running only by reorienting the company not to focus on the top but to focus on the value zone, focus on the bottom and the only and understanding that the only way you can deliver value for your customer is by making sure that everybody from top to bottom is aligned properly and everybody is motivated and everybody is focused on where the value is and are in the business of enabling the creation of the value, rather than measuring how much value did you create. I love it, I love it. Now, okay, and, and folks, this is coming from a man who took his company, HCL Technologies, from 700 million to 4.7 million. Do I have those numbers right? Yeah, 700 okay. billion, 700 million dollars to 4.7 billion, with right. about 87,000 people in 32 countries. So I have I have experience. So all the excuse that it can't be done in America or Germany or Japan or China or Spain or Portugal or India doesn't doesn't wash with me. It it you know we it it was done in 32 countries. It is applicable in all industries and it works and it works very well. I love it. I love it. So there. I love it. Absolutely. Uh, now, okay, the next question is, now this is really important for any doubters. I really like talking to, of course you have to talk to your course, to the people who agree with you. You have to give them 
ammunition to take into the fight, right? But I really like talking to people who want to buy what we're saying, but you have to show them how. So my question for you, how? How did you make this change come about for your company? It was very, it was pretty complex. Yeah, it's simple and complex, right? Right. Most common sense is actually simple and we make it more complex. And let me explain to you why do I say it. So, <laughs> yeah. so when you look at any revolution, right, whether it was Martin Luther King, whether it was Nelson Mandela, whether it was Mahatma Gandhi, uh, they created revolutions based on what I call three-step process. Okay. The step one was a huge amount of dissatisfaction with the current state of being. Good. That I'm unhappy. Right. Uh, the second is to create an aspiration of tomorrow, a vision of tomorrow, which is so compelling that people will jump out of their bed and want to go work for that vision. Right. And third is the strategy is multiple series of experiments to go from the level of dissatisfaction and then to achieve the vision, which is very inspiring. So it's a three-step process, right? right? What do we do in our organization? The first day you walk in, the organization tells you how to act. So it was unhappy. You should be in an organization, and we have done you a great service for you to walk into our organization. So we are actually not telling people what's wrong. We are telling them how proud you should be. So there is no satisfaction. Now, when there is no satisfaction, people don't change. It's like a plumber who walks into your house. And what do you tell him? This is a $6 million house built in 1935. And they were, you know, this painting came in from my grandfather and this from my father and all this stuff. You go on and on and on for one hour. And then the plumber asks you, where the hell is the leak? So when the employee walks into the company, Thank you. I, I apologize for interrupting you. That was awesome. Go ahead. So I, I'm normally awesome, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I have to re-watch this so I can listen to, to, to you again. Go ahead. Please. Tell me more. Uh, so I said, it's, uh, so therefore, when a plumber walks into your house, you know, he's finding a leak. So the same is true with employee. When an employee comes in, he wants to know what is broken. So the first step we did in HCR, is showed the mirror to the organization and said, mirror, mirror on the wall, we are the ugliest of all. And once you do that, then there is a dissatisfaction which gets created in the employees that this has to be fixed, this has to be fixed, that has to be fixed. So everything has to be fixed. Right. Then you create a compelling vision of tomorrow. And what is that vision? So vision could be in growth terms, vision could be a culture. We created a vision of a culture. We will create an employee first culture where an employee will be respected, an employee will be motivated, an employee will get an opportunity. And an employee is the reason we will be competitive in the, in the field, and an employee is the reason we will grow twice compared to our nearest competitor. Right. So that's a vision of tomorrow. So what is your vision of tomorrow? And in that vision of tomorrow, what is in it for the employee? So that's the second step. And then the third and the most important step, there is no one strategy to get it from here to there. When you climb a mountain, you don't know what you know, you know approximately the path you will take, but every single step you take, you take the decision. Same is true in transformation. So when you go from the series of dissatisfaction to a series of the vision of independence which you want to go, you take series of experiments, not one or two big strategies, series of experiments. And this is how most of the leaders got independence to their respective communities or nations. And this is the way the transformation in HCL was done. Create mirror mirror on the wall, dissatisfaction, create a vision of tomorrow which is very compelling, and then series of experiments which brought in the cultural transformation called employee first customer second. And the aha moment happened of a 700, 600% growth over a over seven, eight, seven year period. Absolutely love it. Okay, so you already answered one of my questions, which was mirror mirror. Let's talk about another one. I want to talk about hand of God. I, I love that term in your book much more important is what it represents. What does that represent? How did you get around it? So, you know, we must understand that uh, in, a, in an organization which is very pyramid oriented. Right. Uh, actually, let's, let's go, let me go back. Sure. The most beautiful organization is the startup. 
The way the startup really gets birth is that everybody comes together, they have a great idea, and they said that we want to do something which is very interest, interesting. Nobody has a role, nobody has a nobody has any issues. They come together and do whatever is required to be done. There is no hierarchy, and everybody goes off and starts doing what really is required to be done. As the organization grows bigger, they create a hierarchy, they create pyramids. And as the organization still gets very bigger, the organization becomes suspicious of the same set of people who are creating the value. And therefore yeah. we have controls, right? We have department one and department two and check and balance and all this stuff. Now I have nothing against that. Yeah? You need to have a check and balance, but you must understand that the check and balance you are having, you are creating, you are disabling the value, but you need that. Okay, we have now while you are having that, the hand of God concept is the fact that when you write this beautiful proposal, it takes a huge amount, a humongous amount of time to sell the proposal, but one person can get it over with. I mean, one person can reject. It. So a hand of God will come in and either bless your proposal or a hand of God will come in and you would not even know your proposal is thrown out of the door or your idea is thrown out of the door, or your transfer is thrown out of the door, or promotion is thrown out of the door. So the whole organization gets into a huge amount of what I call zone of uncertainty. Because it is not predictable, it is not logical, because there is a hand of God playing on every move, and it's under, it's not visible. So every employee is uncertain. So when every employee is uncertain, instead of facing and the value we created for the customer, he's watching his back, or he, she's watching his, her back. And saying, okay, what is happening? I'm in back. Who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to network with? Who do I need to take care of so that this fund of yeah, God is placed for me? I think all your listeners should understand, you know, the more transparency we bring into the organization, the more hand of God's will disappear. Okay. The more opaqueness we bring to the organization because of the fear of employees. The more hand of God will come in, the more uncertainty will come in, the more time employees will focus on inside the organization and the less they will focus outside the organization and your organization slowly, and you will not notice it, will slow down and then stop. Oh, absolutely love it. You know, I, I, have, I wrote down one quote, which is that the most beautiful organization is the startup because nobody has a role, everybody just gets to work. Now, I am involved in the startup community here in Naples, Florida, which is just starting, and I'm, um, or just, you know, taking off, I should say, and I advise two groups. One is startups, and the other is enterprises who are terrified of them, for good reason, <laughs> for very good reason. Yeah. So, I love it. Now, all right, in your very large company, you had uh, a bureaucracy in place, and you tamed it through transparency, how else did you tame it? There's there's something in particular, the smart service desk, which I which I absolutely love. How did that work? Because that's that's a revolutionary idea. So before I before I go there, uh, sure. so we are entering a zone of this conversation where you would get a feeling that Vinit has great ideas and he did great job. Uh, don't fall for it, right? So okay. every one good thing we talk about in this conversation, there are ten things which I did wrong. So uh, we, we, we are only talking about things and therefore just remember that these are not great ideas. They look great in hindsight, but in right. foresight there were single experiments which were built over a period of time. Yeah. So the critical question we asked ourselves in the second phase, remember we did mirror mirror and then we created what I call trust based on transparency. So phase one was mirror mirror, the ugliest of all. Second phase was create trust by pushing the envelope of transparency, by throwing all your dirty learnings in public over a digital intranet and let everybody see it. That was the second phase. Now, the third phase was this word called the enabling functions, mm -hmm. right? So under this vocabulary, English vocabulary called enabling functions, we have finance, we have HR, we have administration, we have quality. We have all these people who are so-called enabling the creation of the value. Mm -hmm. When I truly ask the employees that do they really enable, uh, the answer in 99% of the cases, and I'm being polite here, was no. <laughs> uh, so I said, polite. please continue. Yeah. And I was saying, okay, so that's a perception issue, 
and maybe a reality issue, right? It's, it's both. So I, I said, okay, what we should do is create a digital interface between these enabling functions and the employee. So if we were to treat the employee as a guest, and we were to give him a digital system where if he has any problem, he opens a ticket. He opens a ticket on the company. And then the, the ticket, based on it is an HR ticket or a finance ticket or an administration ticket or a bonus ticket or whatever ticket, that department runs to solve the problem. And then the employee closes the ticket. Now, if we do this, two things will happen. Number one, we will capture all the issues of the employees. The employee can't say, I had an issue. I don't know where to express. So you capture all the issues. Okay. Number two, statistically, you can prove to the employee that you solved all these issues. And therefore, we would have a lot more accountable environment. At the same time, the perception that the enabling functions do not enable but disable will go away. Right. So my enabling department got convinced with the idea because they thought it was the perception problem and perception will change. The employees got convinced with the idea because they thought it was not a perception. So they were happy and we lost this program. So we had thousands of tickets in the first week and we celebrated. And because we had thousands of issues which came out and thousands of issues were getting resolved and we were very happy and we were celebrating till one girl, I think in London, and I was doing an open house, uh, told me how stupid I was. And I said, yes, I know I'm stupid, but tell me why this time. <laughs> and he said, there is, I don't think there is any CEO in the world who would celebrate that his employees have thousands of issues. So you are celebrating opening up thousands of tickets. And I, you know, this is, this is the real truth of employee first. That girl had, you know, the audacity and the conviction to tell me that I was stupid and she was right. right. And that day I changed my mind. I said, I'm not going to bonus people on how fast they close the tickets or how many tickets they close. I went to the saying, I want zero tickets. So that is the day the organization started proactively marketing its policies to make sure that when the policy is changed or when the policy is launched, the employee don't have an issue. So from a reactive service oriented organization to our employees, we became a proactive organization which wanted to ensure that the employees have no issues. Now, if you are an employee and this is happening to you, you can understand that employee first, customer second hits you that day when suddenly you found all these departments you know, running against you and saying, please don't open a ticket. I will proactively, you know. So, right, so right. That, that, that girl, one argument, the girl changed everything. I love it. No, and that know, was a service test. Sorry, that last sentence? That was a service test. Okay, good. I, I love it. Now, here's the first thing. I have experience with companies where the, the CEO would come in and talk to people and he would smile at a remark like that. He would leave and that person would be fired. Um, so, so that no, it, it takes a tremendous amount of confident humility to be able to accept criticism like that and, and embrace it. So thank you for that. Just as a, as a human being, thank you. I, I, I think I think it's quite possible that those CEOs were smarter, and I had I was incompetent, so I was listening more, maybe. <laughs> you I know, know what? The they might be smarter, but you're more successful. So who cares about how smart they are? So, yeah. All right. Now, now you're talking like my mother then. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you're too smart for your own good. Now, the next thing is, how did you avoid retribution? These people that they're opening tickets on are then the ones who are giving them evaluations and the ones that are determining their raises and promotions. How on earth did you pull that off? Yeah, so so I think we need to go one more step forward uh, to shock the people who are listening and then answer the question. Good. So once we finish the enabling functions, the enabling functions rightly ask the following question. So we need, we are being measured and we don't have a problem with that. I can understand what about you? And I said, what do you mean? He says, uh, you know, enabling functions are not the only people who are mandated to create value. I said, yes. He says, what about line functions? I said, fair question. So he says, how are you measuring? Where is the trouble ticket for the line function? 
so i said good question so we looked at this 360 degree instrument mm -hmm. the 360 degree feedback normally is used in a lot of companies uh, as an instrument of, of between band of brothers where each one of you tell each other how great that guy is and then you ignore all of it and walk up walk home as if nothing has happened exactly and similar thing was happening in our company that it was an instrument which had actually no meaning with 5% participation, nobody will take it seriously and all that stuff. So we took that instrument and converted that into a digital instrument. And we asked all the employees at that, when we started in 2005, it was 35,000 employees. The last time we did it, it was 85,000 employees. We said all the employees to rate whoever they wanted to rate, including the CEO, confidentially. And then we said that after you have rated, including me, we will make the results public. So my 360 degree appraisal was available to all 85,000 employees and the result of that was published for all to see. And that was true with 6,500 of my colleagues whose appraisal was made public for all employees to see. Now what that did was two things. Number one, it created the inverse accountability which I have been talking about. The fact that managers and management being accountable to the employees. Right. Number two, suddenly the employee felt that everybody thinks this manager is good. I'm the only guy who thinks the manager is bad, so I need to change my opinion. Okay. That's number two. Right. Number three, a lot of people decided that, you know, maybe this, this you know, um, being team leader is not my cup of tea, and they moved away from that. Uh, okay. I, I, I love it. You know, obviously, so, so here's the thing, folks. Obviously, this worked. Uh, if this were some kind of surface, you know, um, poster on a wall kind of, uh, kind of initiative, we wouldn't be talking today. The book wouldn't have been successful. There would be a lot of people saying, you know, no, it's it's a bunch of hype. It's not true. Quite the opposite. So, did you notice that that number, by the way, folks, from thirty-five thousand to eighty-five thousand, fifty thousand people added to this company's size over the course of this leader's tenure, that's more than, I, I'm not good at that kind of math on the fly, but that is much more than 100% growth. Wow, pulling that off is, is impressive. Now, here's the thing. We can go on all day, and I would very much like to. I would like to talk to you for probably five hours, but I know how busy you are, and I also know that um, our our listeners, our, our readers, are usually watching us during their lunch hour. So, um, in in the sake of brevity, let's move on to uh, two things. I want to talk about your foundation very much. Before we do that, I want to um, discuss your you're operating in in 32 countries. Uh, so you truly are a global a global employer. People give Indian IT companies, uh, outsourcing companies, a very bad rap. Um, I have experience working with, I believe, two of your clients working with the uh, the IT department, and um, it's not actually true. Could you talk to us about that, please? Yeah, so we, we are a company which has, uh, you know, so we, we I, I still remember when the recession came in, I was at the World Economic Forum in the year 2010, uh, and I announced that we would create 10,000 new jobs in the U.S. and Europe. Right. Uh, and we actually, you know, were well on our way of creating that. Uh, we were adding almost uh, 1,500 to 2,000 jobs every year. Uh, we are in 32 countries. Uh, we have... Uh, you know, at the last time when I left, we had over 10,000 people in U.S. alone, uh, similar size uh, in Europe, and uh, our business is global. Right. Uh, I think what people uh, misunderstand about Indian IT is is the following statistics: there are four million IT professionals in U.S., and there are three million IT professionals in India. Really. So, so therefore, when you really look at the total value being created in the world using technology, these are the 7 million, and I'm focusing on US right now, these are the 7 million people who will create the next growth opportunity for companies to go digital. Huh. And therefore, you know, the, the world will gain by understanding both the aspirations of the 4 million people and the aspirations of 3 million people and making it work to make it not 7 million but deliver 17 million. And that's what I think uh, companies like HCL did, did pretty well. 
That is really very interesting. I did not know that number, even though I have been um, immersed in enterprise IT for years now and startup IT. Now, um, now, next question, rebadging. Could you please explain the, the, um, what that term means and the math on that? I'm, I'm curious so, myself. Right, so what rebadging means is that when you take over a contract uh, of a customer, uh, you take over all the employees of the customer. That's what is called they are rebadged to the company who takes on the contract. Now the assumption in the rebadged is as a vendor of IT services, you will have greater opportunities for the employees you take on. Uh, and that is the reason the employees have a choice of not joining you. But the critical success factor of any contract is more and more employees join you make a success of the contract, and then create a career for themselves uh, with you for multiple customers instead of serving one customer. So that's that's rebadging. Uh, all right, now, so l let me just say something, folks, because this is this is something that really caught my eye. If, if you're working for a company you don't like all that much, but it's paying your bills, and you can work for a company whose top leader wrote a book called Employees First, Customer Second, Sign me up. All right. All right. I think we're ready. I think we're ready to go into the um, the Sam Park Foundation because the work you are doing is is really inspirational. I myself am a bleeding heart capitalist, and um, obviously you are too. Let's talk about that. So the idea there was that I left uh, the CEO position in HCL in 2013. Uh, and the reason I did that was because I created my own foundation in 2004. And the idea there was to, to drive large-scale social transformation. Yeah. Now, if you if folks have visited India, you would understand when you walk or drive on the streets of India, uh, we have very large problems. We have poverty problems, which are very large. Right. And the only way they can be solved is by somebody putting not Oh shoot! You you froze. Can you still hear me? Okay, you you unfroze. I'm sorry. The way that that your poverty problems can be solved are your volume's off. Oh shoot! This this is my favorite part of our our interview. Huh? All right. Tell you what. I can't hear you, so I'm going to leave and come back, okay? Okay. One second. 